to build a taller building. And then centuries and millennia go by, and then humans make the largest single machine ever made, known as a ship called the Titanic. And they put in print, Kenny, that it was the ship that God himself could not sink because men are greater than God, you see. Right. And, of course, Tower of Babel never finished. Titanic never made one voyage. And then Tricky Dick Nixon, when he knew they were not on the moon, who didn't even have the guts to show up for the launch, imagine that, said putting a man on the moon was the greatest event since creation. So I realized this is actually a blasphemous event, and there was some sort of spiritual symbolism here. So after I read the Bible five times from cover to cover, though I was not a Christian, I realized there is right and wrong. And if they fake the moon landing, that is actually more profound of an event in history than if they had actually gone. So I said, look, I'm going to die anyway. If they faked it, this is worth risking my life to expose because mankind needs to know. It's like if you don't know you have cancer, then you will die of it. And if mankind doesn't know that this is the folly of our leaders, it will destroy us. So I started producing. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon, which led to my second film, Astronauts Gone Wild. And these films all together cost $1 million. So where did I get a million dollars from? It was given to me by a board member of an aerospace company that builds rockets for NASA who knows that the moon landings are fake. And he said it was his patriotic duty to expose this folly. So I'm given a million dollars. I start producing over seven years. It took enormous amount of research. And we you know, bought documents, some of which cost $10,000 each, from the estates of the widows of deceased astronauts to get you know, technical information that's not available to the public. And about three and a half years into this seven year project, I had called NASA previously and said, uh, look, I'm doing a documentary about the moon landings, which is true. And can I please have every picture, still picture, every motion picture and every video of the first mission to the moon? Because I figured, if they faked it, and I wasn't sure, I just knew they might have faked it. I said to myself, if they faked it, then they're more likely to have made a mistake the first time they faked it. So I um, asked for everything from the first mission, and I wasn't about to tell them, and you know, because I'm trying to prove maybe that it never happened. I said, I'm just thorough. So all the footage was just the same thing over and over again. In fact, you won't believe this, but of the greatest event in human history, there's only about 20 still pictures of astronauts standing on the surface of the moon and zero pictures of Neil Armstrong standing on the surface of the moon. People don't know this. People in NASA's archives that I personally visited in the vault did not know this. I said, may I please have a picture of Neil Armstrong, you know, most famous man in the world, uh, standing on the moon during the most famous event in human history may I please have a picture of that? There aren't any. He refused to have his picture taken. Now, their excuse is, well, he was taking the pictures, therefore he's not in them. Well, I know when I take a family vacation, you know, with friends, you know, there's not one camera. Everybody's got a camera. And if, you know, the temperature difference is 500 degree difference between light and shadow and radiation and micrometeorites, it might drop the thing and it might break open. Won't have any pictures of the greatest event in human history. They probably have a backup camera. I would probably put a camera on both of the guys, you know, but it probably cost an extra ten dollars, and they were already over their two hundred billion dollar budget. They didn't want to go over by ten. Maybe that was the reason. So I pop in this yeah. tape because after I'm trying to find the countdown in real time, it's just you know the same thing edited over and over again. Very little real footage. I pop in a tape. It says, "Do not show to the public on the screen." And it's the crew of Apollo 11, dated two days into the flight, faking a one-foot model in outer space, which is not outer space, pretending to be halfway to the moon with a third track of audio of the CIA telling them how to do it, proving beyond a doubt that they never left Earth orbit. So first proof is we have shadows intersecting at 90 degrees. That means they're on Earth, period. Secondly, we have a videotape of them faking a one-foot model 
of the Earth pretending to be halfway to the moon, dated two days into the flight with the CIA reminding them not to answer NASA's questions until four seconds go by to create a fake radio delay as if they're further away. All that's crystal clear on the tape. And then we have the logic. Today, 50 years later, with 50 years of better technology, the farthest that NASA can send an astronaut into space is 250 miles to the space station. Now, the moon is a thousand times farther. So what they're really saying is they had greater technology, a thousand times greater, 50 years ago than today. In fact, this Artemis rocket, the brother of Apollo, the Greek god for destruction, Lucifer, who was the father of lies, they went somehow 50 years ago from never being in space to walking on the moon in eight years. 50 years later, with 50 years better technology, it took 18 years to develop the Artemis rocket that on the first attempt didn't get off the ground, on the second attempt didn't get off the ground, on the third attempt didn't get off the ground, and will only orbit the Earth and not land, and with no one on board because it's too dangerous. So, mm. <laughs> you're letting me speak a long time, and it's like, well, <laughs> so we have that proof, and let me just add one more proof. So that's three proofs. The logic that technology can't be better 50 years ago than, you know, in the future, the, you know, fake footage right in front of your eyes, the intersecting shadows. And then we have a deathbed confession from Cyrus Eugene Akers, who was the chief of security at Cannon Air Force Base on June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of 1968, where he personally stood beside President Johnson while they filmed the fake moon landing. He gave us the code name for the project the, and a list of 15 people he was allowed in on the VIP list to observe the event, including Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, who were apparently not even in the spacesuits at the time. And on his deathbed, he said, I got to tell somebody, and he passed on this information, which is revealed in the book Moonban at sabrell.com for the very first time. In fact, only yesterday, Kenny, I uploaded because I had to wait until so many years after the event and so many years after the death of a surviving son. Just yesterday, I uploaded a video of his son confessing all of this because he was there while his father told him this on his deathbed. He lived across from Cannon Air Force Base. He was there at the mm -hmm. time, and his dad told him everything, including the threat of murder if he ever told anybody. And then simply his son calling me up and telling me a few days after that, his house is broken into by someone who somehow knew the password and all of the you know computer documentation about his father was removed. And two days after that, less than two years ago, two government officials show up and threaten him with death if he ever talked to me again. All of this is in Sabrell.com. And, you know, the second follow up film astronauts gone wild when i show this fake footage that i uncovered to one of the astronauts he turns a beat beat red kicks me from behind curses at me throws me out of his house and in all the commotion i left the wireless microphone on him and in all the commotion my camera guy forgot to stop recording so while the camera's in the back seat of a rental car of the guy's driveway before we pull out and he's and his son the astronaut are in their house with the door closed we're unintentionally recording the private conversations in their house. And there's mm -hmm. the secretary of the film calls me up in a panic a couple of months later when she does the transcript and says, Bart, Bart, you, you know what they're saying in their house? I'm like, no, tell me. He said, they're talking about calling the CIA to have you assassinated. And I'm like, yeah, that's funny. She <laughs> says, Bart, no, no, I'm being serious. They're talking about calling the CIA to have you assassinated. I'm like, that is funny. She says, Bart, you're not listening. Wow. We're talking about calling the CIA to have you assassinated. Now, if they really went to the moon, and I'm some silly person who thinks they didn't do it, why would the CIA have to be, you know, kill some guy who thinks we didn't go to the moon when they really went? But if I have this proof, 
you know, that I uncovered, which made the astronaut curse at me, kick me, turn beat red, and threaten to kill me, if I'm right, well, then maybe the CIA would have to be involved because one of those people on the list was a known CIA agent and another was a known NSA agent, you see? And some of these people are still alive, including Gene Krantz, flight director, who is on the list, and some guy I never heard of, Robert Emmenager, who apparently was like a science fiction consultant because he worked, you know, in the media department at the Pentagon and was a science fiction writer. So he wanted, you know, given his two cents of if, if it you know, looked convincing or not. We have to remember there were no live pictures during the landing. All they showed is a little Atari quality graphic of the, you know, moon lander coming down. And that was it. Then suddenly this black and white picture shows up that is of such poor quality it could have been shot in someone's backyard with the spotlight at night and it would have looked the same. And that convinced everybody that we're on the moon. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, <laughs> an event that cannot be repeated by any nation on earth to this day. I mean, the Wright brothers got off the ground in, in 1903. Imagine, you know, by 1953, they were breaking the sound barrier in jets. Okay. From a kite motorized kite. But imagine that in 1903, the Wright brothers got off the ground, and for shucks, 50 years later, no one can even do that, not even the nation who built the kite. You see how illogical that is? Even the South Pole here on Earth, was no one made it the first time they tried or the second or the third. It's about the fourth time they made it. But somehow, when in the entire history of aviation, not a single flying machine got off the ground on the first attempt, not even the 747 that took 168 attempts to get off the ground. Somehow, the most complicated aerospace, you know, endeavor ever done worked the first time, but can't be repeated 50 years later. So there you go. I've talked for 21 minutes. <laughs> now you have time to answer a few questions, ask a few questions. Well, I mean, you've answered a lot of them, but uh, yeah, I've, I've, been into that whole moon fake moon landing for years, talked about it with my friends for years. And I've noticed the same things. I was wondered how, how we were able to do something so, you know, great on so little technology. And I watched an episode of something where, uh, Elon Musk was talking and they had asked him during this SpaceX thing, you know, about going to the moon. And he said, well, we don't have the technology to go to the moon. You know, and this was several years ago. He said, we don't have the technology, son. I'm not saying we could never get it. He said, but it's going to take billions of dollars to try to get it. And I was just like, don't have the technology. I thought, you know, I thought we went to the moon. Where, where is all that technology? You know, don't, surely you have all that written down, recorded, right? Well, actually, they don't. You know, the, the uh, what was it, the B-52 bomber, okay, that, air, that jet aircraft that can carry some enormous amount of, you know, material like six or eight tons of bombs, something outrageous. Uh, it was built 70 years ago. And there's still 200 of them being used by the Air Force today because nothing works better. Now, going to the moon in 21st century, you know, to $2022 cost $200 billion. Wow. And they admit, Don Pettit, go to my website, go to sabrell.com, click on the top button, Moonman video links, because my book is interactive. And it says, like, read a chapter, go to clip one, read a chapter, go to clip two. Their own astronaut says they deliberately destroyed that technology. Now, when they built the atomic bomb and they used it to win World War II, Maybe they should have deliberately destroyed that technology, but they didn't. And only 10 years later, atomic bombs were 1,000 times more powerful. So if we could go to the moon on the first attempt with one millionth of computing power of a cell phone, we would have been on Mars 10 years later. We'd be in another solar system by now, and there'd be bases all over the moon, just like there are bases all over the South Pole. Why are there bases at the South Pole? Even though it's 100 mile per hour winds at 100 degrees below zero, because it's technologically possible. So if it were technologically possible to go to the moon 50 years ago, there'd be bases all over the thing. And so Don Pettit says they destroyed the technology intentionally. 
Now imagine Bill Gates spending $200 billion to build the first AI computer, or let's say Elon Musk in this case. So Elon Musk spends $200 billion. He builds the first AI. It's sentient. It has its own thoughts, its own life, whatever you want to call what AI theoretically could be. He spent all that money, all that time. It works fabulous. Then he demolishes it with a sledgehammer, throws it in a furnace, and takes all the drawings, all the schematics, and burns them up too. Is that what he would do? Why would they destroy the technology that cost them $200 billion, all the hardware, all the schematics, and all the blueprints? It's because they did not have the battery capacity to sit on the lunar surface for three or four days and get it, you know, the air conditioning down to 72 degrees against 250 degrees outside on a bunch of car batteries. That could be proved electronically. Therefore, they destroyed the proof of that. If they really went to the moon, they would never destroy that technology. But if they committed a fraud, they would destroy everything to cover up the fraud. So the fact that they destroyed everything is actually proof of the fraud. And then back to Elon Musk. Elon Musk wanted to land a rocket vertically so that it could be reused. All right now, mind you, he has five computers. Sorry, six six computers on each side of that rocket. Six different engines with its own supercomputer on each side of that rocket to constantly gimbal that thing so that it can land vertically. Okay, these are computers one million times better than the Apollo computers. The first time he tried to land the rocket vertically, it blew up. The second time, it blew up. The third time, it blew up. The fourth time, it blew up. The fifth time, I think it worked. So how did they land a rocket vertically six times with one millionth of computing power on the first attempt? On the moon. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So why do people believe it anyway? It's because it's a god to them. You know, whoever killed Kennedy, he's dead. Who, whoever did 9-11, they're dead. But the faking of the moon landing was giving the public the candy that they wanted. And we're taking away that candy. Mm -hmm. And they throw a temper tantrum. And I talked to a college professor, and I showed him all this proof. And he says, Bart, there's no proof you could show me that would ever make me think that my adored moon landings are fake. And I said, well, what about this? What if you saw Neil Armstrong on national TV tearfully confessing that he faked it? that it was shot at Clo a Cannon Air Force Base in Clovis, New Mexico. He regrets it. He's sorry. Please forgive him. And the professor said, I still think he walked on the moon. He's lying. Exactly. <laughs> you know, suddenly went crazy or something. He's you lying. Know? Yeah. He, yeah. yeah. And uh, he's lying about lying, you know. And, and so <laughs> it's amazing. It's like it doesn't matter. It, 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 there's nothing he could he could watch Hitler mutilate a baby and say say it's still like Hitler, right? You know, and so there's just, what does that mean? The Bible talks about this. It says pride causes your blindness. You cannot see the truth with pride. You can't. And God says He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Well, what is pride? Pride is simply the unwillingness to be wrong. And humility is the willingness to be wrong. I was willing to be wrong. I didn't know of any bigger fan of the moon missions than me. How many people have 20 pictures of Apollo 11 on their wall since the age of four? How many? Yeah, probably not very many. And so it's like the Bible, you know, uh, their greatest killer of Christians became their leader. <laughs> and it's like, you know, the greatest fan of the moon landings became the greatest critic. We have to be. We have to be open minded and we have to. So what does all this mean? It means that the people who run our government are criminals and murderers, because the second to the last chapter of the book Moon Man, which you can get at sabrell.com, I reveal other information never disclosed. And a funny thing happened on the way to the moon because I was told to wait until certain people have passed away. That information is the following. Neil Armstrong was not originally going to be the first man to walk on the moon. That was a guy named Virgil Gus Grissom. He was the most beloved of all the astronauts in the public's eye. And 
he was critical of the space program. He said, we are 10 years or more away from going to the moon instead of two years. He said that in 1967. In fact, he was pre preparing congressional reports to give to Congress to say, look, this needs to be fixed. This needs to be fixed. This needs to be fixed. Everything is shoddy equipment. It'll never get to the moon. And in fact, his papers of, of these things were confiscated from his home before they even informed his widow that he was dead. So the day before he burned alive in a, quote, accident, he came home and said, honey, to his wife, who I interviewed for three hours, Betty Grissom, he said, honey, for some strange reason, the CIA, for the first time ever, is all over the launch pad today. I wonder why. The very next day, the guy's dead. His wife and his son, who's a 747 pilot, have forensic evidence that the CIA caused that fire. The CIA murdered the crew who would have been the first crew to walk on the moon. Not my opinion, the opinion of the dead man's widow, the opinion of the dead man's son. So what does this mean, Kenny? It means our government officials are murdering their own citizens to cover up their crimes. What does the Declaration of Independence say? When any government becomes destructive of these ends of liberty, the pursuit of happiness and life, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Criminals are running our country. Criminals killed Kennedy. The guy's own nephew, who has more inside information than we do, says the CIA murdered his uncle, right? We have 3,000 architects and engineers say it's a mechanical impossibility for a pinhole airplane to go through a skyscraper and cause its destruction. It'd be like throwing a pencil through a screen door. It would not collapse the door. Then who did it? It must be the United States federal government rogue agents who did it. You see, mm -hmm. so they murdered their own president. And why did they murder him? He was going to abolish the CIA mm. <laughs> and, you know, right. get rid of the corrupt bankers. Right. And so they murdered. CIA. And then what we have, Robert McNamara, before he died, he had a little deathbed confession. He says, oh, by the way, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which was a attack alleged of a North Vietnamese you know, ship on an American ship. We, the CIA made that up, and that was the, the cause of the beginning of the Vietnam War. They made up the excuse to kill 58,220 Americans. They made it up. You a see false, that? Like killed, a false flag. That's right. So, And this is not contested. This is not a conspiracy theory. These are the words of Defense Secretary during the Vietnam War. These are the words of the dead man's nephew who knows all about the Kennedy assassination. These are the words of the dead astronaut's widow and son. These are the words of a filmmaker who can tell you that shadows cannot intersect in sunlight. That means it's electrical light. That means they're on Earth. When then we have an eyewitness who was there who told us the names, the dates, the location, the code words, so forth and so on. So this is this is a dangerous time that we're living in. Our government's corruption, like every other technology, is only getting better and more efficient over time. Their deception, their control of people's minds to deceive them and murder them is even greater than it had ever been before. And unless they are stopped, it will be our destruction. That's why Orwell said, whoever controls the past controls the future. So as long as it's claimed that we walked on the moon when we did not, then those criminals will run our lives. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Whoever controls the past controls the future. So unless we expose the moon landing fraud, the federal government will remain corrupt until the end of time. Mm-hmm. Hello, my name is Gene Gilmore. Uh, my birth given name is Eugene Rubin Akers. 
I don't want any money for what I'm doing because hopefully this video won't come out until after my death. So I have nothing to gain, nothing to profit by telling you what I'm going to tell you. And um, a lot of what I'm going to tell you is available online until they see this video. And I'm sure things will start getting scrubbed. Um, as well as moon photos. But anyway, my father uh, in 1968 was stationed at Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. I made notes on my computer um, so that uh, I wouldn't forget anything because uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of little things and stuff that I'd forget. So uh, these notes were made a long time ago. The original recording that my father made on his deathbed was... Um, um, destroyed in a fire, um, but um, so this is my deathbed confession because now I'm dying of cancer. I've got cancer all over the place, and so and they don't know where it's coming from, and I don't know if they can stop it, but it don't look good. So I'm going to go ahead and make this video for Bart Cybrell. He knows not to do anything with it until uh, until notification of my death uh, for which my son will respond to that okay um, like I said in 1968 my father was stationed at Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico uh, we lived in Clovis New Mexico he was in the military police for over 20 years and on his deathbed in 2002 we made a recording of what happened and I already told you what happened to the recording but it doesn't matter because all the facts are there, so it doesn't matter who's telling the story or whatever. Um, I will, at the end of the video, I'll supply a picture of my father, his badge, um, the flag of when they buried him. I'll show you some photos, photo, photos of my dad. Um, I was born in 1955, so in 1969, I was 14 years old. I vividly remember the... Uh, Paul 11 coming down, landing on the moon, they're walking around and all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, I never, I never questioned that until, um, until my dad told me what he told me on his deathbed. And then I started doing a little, nothing major or nothing, just surfing the web, I think they call it surfing, surfing the web. Um... And a lot of that information is right there on the web. I mean, it, it, it verifies the story that he told me. Um, a good detective, a good one, would be able to uncover a lot more uh, of the story than I'm getting ready to tell you. So, please have at it. I've never known my dad to lie. Um, to get caught lying was worse than whatever it was you did to begin with. I remember going to school with long sleeve shirts on uh, to hide the purple welts. Yeah, you did not lie in our house, that's for sure. Dad had a real, <clears throat> really bad attitude towards lying. Excuse me again. Um, okay, anyway, this is, this is the story that my dad told me on his deathbed. Project Slam Dunk was the name of of this. Um, President Johnson in 1968, okay, um, in Cannon Air Force Base in 1968, he said by that time, by the time he got there, that there was already two large hangars that were connected. There was hundreds of dump trucks that came in and dumped sand and uh, uh, stone and uh, cement powder was powdered over the top of all that to make it look like a lunar landscape. They had men that fa fashioned it into a lunar landscape, he said. Okay, I've never known my dad to lie, so this all took me by surprise. You know, <laughs> what's that all about? So anyway, um, he said that in front of the, uh, the airplane hangars uh, was uh, pole framing with uh, large canvas tents um, that was uh, concealing the inside of the staging area. Inside the staging area, 
uh, on flatbed trucks uh, was on created um, the lunar lander that was assembled, reassembled back inside the hangars. Um, all of the walls were painted flat black and the ceilings as well. He was sworn to secrecy by the NSA and uh, they would put him in prison for breaking that oath. And when Dad saw the, the moon landing on TV, he cried. He said he knew um, that what he had witnessed on TV was exactly what they recorded in that hangar. Um, there was no reason for them to go flying around and everything. They had detailed high definition photos of the landing area. There was no reason for them to go flying around to a different landing area that almost exhausted their fuel except for drama because everything had gone so smoothly um, nothing you know so it had to be something anyway um, dad was one of three guards that guarded the uh, the inside of the front entrance there was a list of 15 people who could enter no one else was allowed by order of President Johnson and here is that list and I gave it to Bart Seibrell as well uh, and he checked out a lot of these names and he says he can verify a lot of these people and what they do um, and I come across a couple myself anyway President Johnson Neil Armstrong Edwin Alden Werner von Braun, Robert Emenager, Gene Krantz, James Webb, Joe Kerwin, Dr. Thomas Paine, Glenn Looney, Dr. for Christopher Kraft, Dr. James Van Allen, General Trudeau, Trudeau, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Donald Simon, and Grant Norrie. Now, the only two that I ha really have information on is Robert Emenager. Uh, apparently, he did uh, a lot of uh, video work and stuff for uh, um, the Department of Defense. Um, so, the, the, the DOD did know him. Okay, And the other one was uh, Grant Norrie, N-O-R-R-A-Y, I believe, um, was... Uh, to the best of my to the best of my dad's knowledge was a uh, uh, like some FBI CIA NSA who knows something like that okay okay President Johnson only showed up for the first day of filming filming lasted for three days and the entire project was restored to original in other words the hangars were all taken apart the sand was all removed and so on and so forth okay um, Dad said there was a lot of building going on at the base so at the time so sand and cement powder was never questioned. Um, I can see how they could smuggle that all in within everything else that's going on. Um, since 2002 I have dug up at, I already told you about that the evidence for the moon landing that I have found. Um, if you go to Google and go to uh, uh, Cannon Air Force Base website, they admit that President Johnson was there. The lunar lander was there. The astronauts were there. I also have uh, uh, verified some of the people on the list were there. I also verified there are a lot of uh, building going on in the base, just as he had told me. And all of this was going on at the same time, on the same date. Dad told me all these things father to son. Um, he also told me not to ever tell anyone what he had said, but he said on his deathbed that he had to tell somebody before he died because it was just too important not to tell. I sure as hell wasn't going to tell anybody. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I feared for my wife and, and me and my son, and I'll tell you why. Ever since I contacted Bart Sabrell, I think they may be listening to his phone once in a while because I never had any problems until I contacted him and told him my story. Now,
people broke into my house two times. I was visited by men with black suits and I was told in no uncertain terms to drop this whole project not to say anymore to anybody or me and my wife and my son could disappear. You take that pretty literally after everything that's going on. Well, so I stopped contacting Bart and now I'm making this video that I'm going to send to Bart. Mr. Cybrell, excuse me. Bart's my brother, man. My brother in heart, my brother in, in Jesus, okay? Um, Bart, being a good friend that he is, called the police for me and told them about the break-ins. The two detectives that came out and everything questioned me and everything like that, I didn't give them any information at all. At the time, I thought it was a test from the guys in the black suits. I didn't say crap. Um, so all that, all that went away and everything, but it definitely the two guys in the black suits were not the two uh, detectives that came out to question me about the break-ins. But thanks, Bart. <laughs> <clears throat> but no, I don't want any help. I just, I just want somebody to pick up where I left off and be able to prove with the information I've given. And I'm trying to give as much as I can because I know that once I die, I'm not going to be able to be asked any questions. So that's why why I tried to give you a little backstory too. But um. That's about all I can think of. I, I uh, my dad, he raised me by the book. I know he didn't lie to me. And as I started seeing more and more of what he was telling me was true, I realized my dad wasn't lying. I lifted the lid off my dad's case, and you can see. His name is Cyrus Eugene Akers. He was born on July 17, 1933. He died on September 28, 2002. Uh, here's his badge, and I wanted to see if I could get as close as possible so that you can read the numbers on the bottom, which are... Okay, there it is. zero seven five nine six zero seven five nine six that's my dad and it must have been a really early picture because he's only got two stripes so that that was back in the 50s I'm sure Probably not long after I was born. And there he is. That's my father. My dad, he raised me by the book. I know he didn't lie to me. And as I started seeing more and more of what he was telling me was true, I realized my dad wasn't lying. <laughs>